Hello, everybody. We have Hikaru Nisanke from OMMX. Um, in Instagram, it says Office MMX. Um, should we ask Hikaru what OMMX is short for? It's a date. So oh. MMX are the Roman numerals for 2010, which is the year that we founded. Ah, we yeah. sounds perfect. Okay, so OMMX um, approach uh, is rooted in academia, but is above all grounded by practice and dialogues. And they create spaces that we can all relate to and that help us relate to one, one another, which is so important. Um, they have been nominated for the EU Prize for Contemporary Architecture, the Lisbon Triennale Debut Award, and are included on the ages 40 under 40. Um, they said, a showcase of architecture's brightest up and coming talent. Um, it's brilliant to have you Hikaru today and we are so excited to listen to what he says about these home spaces. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Can you just let me know that, is that working still? It works perfectly. Brilliant. Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting. Um, inviting me to give a talk today. Um, so firstly, just in the housekeeping, if I'm speaking too quickly and you're struggling to understand, um, do just let me know. Keep it, you know, turn off your mic and just say, please, can you speak um, more slowly? Or if you have any questions about what a word means or what I'm saying, um, again, just, you know, feel free to ask me on the spot. But uh, Vincent also said that you guys can write to me afterwards as well, so that's fine. But just in case um, you're all left there going like, what is he saying? Um, <laughs> yeah, let me know. So um, I wanted to present the work of the office as being part of a kind of continuum. And by that, I don't just mean in the sense that um, when we're designing that we hope to be aware of the things that have come before us. Um, which might be kind of response to context, whether that is a physical context like the site or a cultural or social context and so on. But also we're really interested in this kind of very obvious idea in design, oops, sorry, my phone's going off, um, that the things you create are often neglected and that the spaces and buildings that we design get lived in. And through being lived in, we have to accept that they get misused, like things that are meant to function one way get fu function a different way. They get adapted. They need to get repaired. They need to get maintained. And as we've seen this past year, and I'll try and kind of return and to this theme of COVID, but it's, it's quite difficult because we're all, I think, responding to a live situation in a way um, as it evolves. But as we've seen this last year, life has thrown very unexpected things our way and by that I mean you know your bedrooms have now become universities you know somehow and um, this idea of functional what the home is or even all of these things are unraveling right before our eyes um, so challenge your professors on that um, and we need to make more tolerant and more male malleable and by malleable I mean sh spaces that can change um, one, one that makes room for change. Spaces that are maybe, or buildings that are able to grow, shrink and reorder themselves um, in tune with the environment and also in tune with the demands of people's lives. So what is this image? Minson was asking me, why have you got a hand? <laughs> so the image that you see here is what you might call one of the first human portraits. So it's from the Chauveau Caves in France, and it shows the human instinct to mark territory as a kind of body part or to record, to record oneself. Um, you know, there are examples of them re recording hunting on cave walls and these sorts of things. But perhaps this is the first moment where the gaze, where one's like, what's it called, like vision, like uh, what you're looking at, um, is turned inwards from the surroundings onto oneself. So one area of interest in the office is beginning to understand an art, 
a kind of interest in how architecture um, becomes a mirror of our lives. But probably more interesting about thing about these paintings is um, this kind of collective act of recording, you know, a community. And these are kind of these are handprints were created over thousands of years, not just. You know, everything these days is like within the space of a year, two years, three years. But to try and understand that a work can can be completed or remain incomplete. Um, and that becomes a collective portrait of a community. I think that's we thought that was quite important. So I mean, some maybe is familiar with this because I, I also studied with, uh, with G. Houseman. <laughs> um, so when we started the office, we tried to consciously depart from the methodology that we were taught with taught in our diploma, um, you know, when we were at university and kind of, I guess, around your age. But it was also very difficult to shake some of the teaching that you learn. Um, and in fact, um, yeah, what you see on the left was a kind of sampling that we would kind of do in, in small fragments and moments and these sorts of things. And we were encouraged, I think, to sample existing parts of buildings. So this one was a kind of sample of elephant and castle, like lots of different fragments of elephant and castle that were severed from their geography or location, a bit like when you study butterflies, you know, it's a, you call it a kind of taxonomy, you know, when you arrange all these insects in a row. Um, to understand a place, not through its image, like it's photo photo con conventional photography or it's mapping, but through this kind of one-to-one -one act of like construction and culture, how you understand the culture of building through the way things are made as opposed to the way things look maybe. And so I suppose that because we were instructed in quite a specific approach and methodology, we were less interested in kind of like adopting um, the aesthetic of our teaching of what we were taught but the fundamentals were kind of laid the groundwork I guess to the way that you we think so you know this is kind of group work so with this group of 12 students we then create these really large scale collages that I guess were the size of a wall um, and try to create a kind of misreading of those spaces or create something new from something old so kind of these are all fragments of an existing city or an existing place within a city but kind of recollage to create a, a completely new place or completely fictional place and there was this kind of like slightly strange parlor game this slightly strange game that was constructed that I think kind of we retained some qualities of in 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 the way that we think not the way that our projects look so we don't work like this anymore or at least we don't make things that look like this. But our, our process is probably pretty conventional in some ways. Um, yeah, yeah, it's always been underpinned by this idea that the city is made from many hands or design should be made from many hands and not really in pursuit of, let's say, this kind of per perfect object for eternity. So this idea that the whole could be composed by many hands is something that we have certainly carried through when we and when looking at something like this, which is the surrealist parlor game or called this exquisite corpse, wherein each individual took a cue from the previous designer. Do you know what an exquisite corpse is? I don't know. Maybe I'll make a conversation. No? So can you see there's kind of three lines, two lines within the page, which subdivide the page? So one person would create the collage at the bottom and then pass, fold the sheet of paper over and then pass it on. And then the next person would collage the middle and then pass it on. And then the third person would collage without seeing what the previous person had done. It sort of um, looks like those mix and match children's book, you know, with that, that you can flip through in the different pages and make other funny collages. Hmm. <laughs> like these sorts of things, but they, I guess they had their kind of origins in, in yeah, in this sort of thing. Um, but we thought it's a nice analogy of how we work with cities or how we should work with cities and buildings. Um, so 
a question we ask ourselves is what happens when this method, which is obviously quite willful in these sorts of things, collides with reality and standards and standardization and codes. So if you take something like housing or a residential space, kind of government design guides and policy kind of dictate or assume a certain number, type, scale of, and space around furniture. And so what you see here is like the layout of a one person, let's say a two bed, three person flat on the third line. You can see the kitchen on the left, um, a living room, a bedroom, and you're probably all quite familiar with this. But what we became kind of curious in is the fact that the furniture itself becomes a measure of your right to the city. So, you know, it's not the bricks and mortar. The dimensions of the room that you are in, right, like that you're all in the bedroom, let's say, that has been granted permission to be built, has been dictated by what furniture is in it. So a bedroom being a double bed with whatever, yeah? And increasingly in London, when space is so, you know, constrained and limited now is so valuable, you know, the councils won't even let you kind of exceed these by too much. You know, I think if you're very wealthy, you can do like third plus 30% of these. Um, so, but it's interesting, right? Like the, the furniture that we buy somehow or our understanding of furniture and use, thinking to the conversation about misuse and what, how to something functions is actually a measure of our rights to the city. And this is completely necessary in safeguarding our quality of life or minimum standards or quality of life. But they can also be very limiting. So we've talked a lot in the office about how furniture not only governs how we live together, but through its dimension and relation to the human body, how it's also become a fundamental building block of our cities and these rights. That... But we aren't all the same. So like Bruno Minari shows in this exercise, we might try to seek comfort in an uncomfortable chair in different ways. We don't always use the fundamental building blocks of objects, space and furniture in the same way. We try to remember when we work that people misbehave. We stand on chairs, we sit on bollards, we sleep on sofas and we work in baths. So this image is the screenwriter Dalton Trumbo kind of working in his bathtub. And it shows that we are all opportunists. Do you know what that means? I guess. It means like we take advantage of the situation that we're in. So we're all opportunist, opportunists who kind of take the things around us for different uses or use the things around us for different uses beyond their original intention. And we routinely misuse our furniture and we routinely misuse the spaces that we reside in. So part of this, what I'm saying, is a really simple recognition that different people and different cultures have evolved different cultural norms, which affects the design of the spaces in which they reside. So if we can recognize that we are all different and our needs are different, what does this all mean in relation to how we design and account for diverse future scenarios and users? And of course, when I say these things, one is thinking of COVID, but I think particularly when you're dealing with the built environment, and I think if you're dealing with any design subject, you need to think long-term. So yes, COVID has illustrated that our cities need to be resilient to disease. They need, our homes need to be resilient to, you know, flexible, so they can become other things in times of emergency, whether, I don't know, war or, you know, conflict or disease or any of the stresses that are on us. But it's a reminder, it's a poignant reminder that we need to, it goes beyond an aesthetic, right? This is not about postmodernism, modernism, like uh, these sorts of things. There, there's something fundamental at play, which is about being human and what the spaces we reside in mean and what we need them to do for us. So an architect or designer cannot, broadly speaking, always know the lives of the people we design for in enough detail. But what we might seek to observe um, is a kind of, or design even, is um, 
to build in a capacity for co-authorship. So how can you help these people create spaces that work for them or reflect them or mirror them like the hand in the cave? And this is something that we'll return onto later, but our interest in this idea of co-authorship was kind of, came to, I guess, kind of climax a couple of years ago when we were working up a proposal for the British Pavilion in Venice, um, where we were investigating the nature of suburban volume house building. And by suburban volume house building, I mean, in the UK, this is maybe it's, um, maybe it's, it's a specific condition, but I think you find it across the world, which is just like this crust of housing in the suburbs, which doesn't really involve architects, which is just like pure, you know, in the UK, it's like the lowest of the low, it's considered some of the worst kind of housing in Europe. Um, and it's built without architects, but it's often kind of disparaged. And what we wanted to look at when we were there was actually to look at its successes, to say it's too easy to say this stuff is awful. Yeah, that's been widely written about, but what's actually really working there? And so we work, worked with anthropologists from UCL, which is a university here in the UK. And anthropologists have a very different view on the built environment. It's not about this kind of magic moment of creation. So it really is about how things are used and lived in. And so we began to understand that suburbia in particular has kind of cultivated or created a condition where people feel comfortable to remake their surroundings in their own image. There's no stylistic guide. They can do what they want. And suburbia for many reasons gave people the freedom to do this. And the suburban home became a framework upon which residents can project their own tastes, bad tastes if they are, if you want to say that, and desires aligned with their changing life situation. And we tried to move away from this idea of bad and good taste. So for that reason, I think much of what I will cover will allude to or directly refer to this type of domestic environment. But so kind of, you've got to bank all of this stuff. So I'm going to talk about six projects progressing in scale from the size of a piece of furniture to the size of a kind of big bit of city. And each of them is an attempt to acknowledge that architecture can be enabling and open-ended, that it needs to unmeet uncertain, it needs to meet certain futures. It needs to be adaptable, but be enough there to you know, provide some framework that people can use and build, build from. So first, an object with ambiguous function. So ambiguous means uh, not fixed, many maybe, I'll come back to that. So returning briefly to the notion of the space standard, when we were asked to produce designs for a piece of furniture, we started to think about the overlaps in dimension of various pieces of furniture. So what do I mean by that? Can a chair become a table, a footrest, a shoe rack, a side table, a shelf, and so on. Like these diagrams are really problematic because not everyone has the same body type or the same mindset or these sorts of things. And at the same time, we were also thinking about economy. Perhaps how standardization has meant that spaces of the home might become more efficient, which is to be put mildly. So there are, at least in the UK, certain areas of the house which have been deemed surplus to requirements, notably the space of the lobby or the porch or threshold space. So they're considered, you know, you don't need them, chuck them. You know, as a developer, they can become windowless boxes, you know, really uninspiring spaces. And this is especially true when you think of how the housing stock of this country has become subdivided into flats. So you know, many houses have just been converted into like six flats and people crammed in. And I think this is a story you see kind of across the world and the major global cities, I guess. They're under huge pressure. So often the lobby or entrance hall is shared with many other people. So it simply becomes a space of transit. No one stays there anymore. It's not a space you can dwell in, it's, it, nor can it be filled with clutter, the clutter of life and things, you know. 
So our piece was kind of a response to that. And we created this collage to start thinking about how we might rethink a piece of furniture. So, um, and we were specifically looking at the pieces of furniture to do with entering and leaving a room. And the really aspirational, so in the UK, they're like obsessed with like country homes and these sorts of things. So it's like the really grandeur, like aspirational things that people want in their, in their lobby, but it just don't exist anymore. Like you can't, you don't really have too much space for this. And so what you'll see is it's kind of the umbrella stand, it's the grandfather clock, it's the mirror, it's plants, it's coat racks, it's shoe racks, you know, these sorts of things. And our brief became like within the office to design something that was not a chair, not a side table, not a drawer, not a coat stand, not a grand grandfather clock, not a plant pot, nor a mirror. But we wanted to create all of them at once. So through a single material. So we, these drawings just show, and probably can't really see it very well, but I'll show you a photo later. But we were working with sheet material. So this is a mirrored, um, mirrored aluminium. Um, and what you'll see is that backrest is actually a dressing mirror. At the top, you'll see there's a clock. There's a, um, the leg becomes the kind of plant pot or umbrella stand. There's a shoe rack at the bottom and a clothes hook at the back. So we're intrigued by the idea that its plan wouldn't resemble any other piece of furniture, but it contained lots of bits and pieces of the other and that it might contain just enough structure to hold it up. But when you kind of start to inhabit it, you can see it's kind of constituent part, parts that the coat hanger and so on and so forth. So this is a prototype, which you'll, we're kind of still manufacturing the final one. This is in the wrong finish. So this is just in, um, I think this is in brushed steel or sandblasted steel but it needs the mirror finish. So it's missing that, the mirror, the mirrored nature of it. Um, but what you'll see is the art, so that we were looking, we really love the artist, um, the, the work of the artist, Richard Wentworth and his series of kind of everyday observations in, the, in his book, um, Making, Doing, Getting By. And we thought it's nice to mention here. So these photos show how misuse um, well, they show misuse and everyday kind of appropriation of things. And we like this idea of providing cues that you might provide a cue for something's use rather than being fixed and determinate. And so what you'll see is there is a kind of like the leg is cut and folded to create a ledge, but that could be for shoes, for keys, for papers, for, you know, anything. And there's a hook of sorts that you could hang a coat on or turn around to hang a picture. So onwards to buy one. <laughs> do you sell them online? <laughs> yeah, they're really expensive. They're really expensive. It's for really? a gallery. It's for a gallery. Um, oh wow. Um, did you did you produce just one piece? Yeah, so we need to get it in the right finish. They actually manufactured it in the wrong finish. So we need to go back and <laughs> well, we're remaking it. We weren't happy with the final the workmanship on the final piece, so we're we have to. I think bit. Can... I, they, they did it in the wrong finish yeah. and the finish was super important so oh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah it needs we, we have to resolve it yeah um so a room with many functions to continue this thought of ambiguity or perhaps more accurately kind of hybridity so lots of things happening at once i want to talk about an exercise in living within a single room and in close quarters and we were asked by a gallery in Poland. So this project, although not built, it was kind of commissioned by the National Gallery of Art in Poland and shown in the v &A, um, in their architecture galleries um, and also at the Milan Architecture Triennale. So it was kind of a piece that, although will not be built, was there to serve as a provocation, I think, about living in very small spaces. So a really important reference that we were kind of asked to respond to was this animated short film Tango from 1980 and I think you should watch it it's incredible so for the um the film is basically depicting an initially empty room and a ball bounces in through the window and a boy enters to retrieve it 
And this series of actions repeats over and over and over. It's kind of hypnotic. It's just like on repeat. And the film um, gets overlaid with more and more repeating actions. So like more and more people come in to the mix and it's all incredibly choreographed. So they kind of never touch, but they all kind of dance around one another, hence the name Tango, right, which is a dance. And you might call it a humorous portrait of those living in co close quarters with other people. So we asked ourselves how we might create, live in a single room, but a room, can it like a tiny room be generous? So this isn't really a thought, this isn't really a thought experiment given that in the UK, um, we kind of have to confront this reality, you know, all the time. It, we're really building the smallest homes in Europe. Um, and as, a dwelling space in the, as the dwelling space in the inner city shrinks, we seem to have arrived at this very strange condition where we, the kind of, and it's kind of this kind of inverse correlation between the more and more things that we own. So we're buying loads, we consume loads, and we have le less and less space in which to put them. And so people are now hiring space in storage containers to contain their stuff often. You know, we need the spillover space that maybe replaces attics and sheds or spare bedrooms that we used to have but no longer have. So beginning from this position, we started from a sm as small a plot as possible around the size of a single room. And our ambition was to take the elements of a typical suburban home and to compress them onto this tiny plot. So can we take a kind of three bedroom house and create all of the things without losing any of them in this tiny space and each space borrowing from the adjacent areas to create something that feels generous and a an, an kind of ambiguous way of living. So our room is organized around the spiral um, with a kind of raised double bed area that sits above here, a small living area which is here and it contains a spare single bedroom bed for guests which is obviously also a sofa, um, a, cons a kitchen which is kind of like this whole row here and a private garden which is this space here which is tiny but it really feels like you know you're part of this space and I'll show you in the section part of a much larger space. And then how that can start to kind of tessellate. And we married it to create this kind of very, very narrow kind of streetscape. So we're kind of projecting a kind of dense urban environment. And so we took the iconic suburban home section, which is its pitched roof and chimney. And we kind of pulled it apart. And then the section of the street becomes a kind of dissection, you know, a splitting of the suburban home. So rather than splitting it into flats, you kind of split it into quadrants. So here you have one unit with its um, garden and another unit here. And what you'll see is that it's slightly sunken so that as you stand in this space here, you are somehow, you have a completely continuous view all the way across throughout the whole section. So you feel like even though you're in a tiny space, you are actually part of a much larger space. But when you sit down, you stop being a part of it. And we really carefully control and the bed, for example, here, even though on the street, somehow you can't see, like you have privacy, this forms a shield, like the way the roof kind of works. So you, here you can see um, that these rooms kind of densely pack along narrow streets. Oh, I should also add that we did the party wall, which is this wall here between the units and they're designed so that you can build up. So this was like very much considered this kind of seed home that you would give one room, but then people could build further rooms on top. Um, so they would kind of densely pack and terminate in, obviously when you have small, tiny rooms, you need really good public spaces. So we suggested that you might have like public squares and public buildings kind of grafted in, within that kind of mat of housing. Um, and the tightness of the urban grain, the rhythm of the boundary walls, the continuity of the ground plane from inside and out, um, subdivide the street into a small set of urban interiors 
So we were really thinking of these as tiny little rooms as well that somehow bleed across the site. And so that there's this kind of very collective and intimate kind of sense of responsibility for the street. And last year we ran a unit, I don't know if you know the school, the AA, um, which is where we currently teach, but um, so we ran a unit which looked at the contemporary landscape of suburbia, namely the tr tracts of land around the metropolitan line in London, which is kind of colloquially known or like commonly known as Metroland. And so the project is born from the belief that there is real benefit in and ample tolerance to compress living conditions. So we were really like going the other way from what architects say, typically say to create affordable housing. And we wanted to try to try and preserve the traditional independence and freedom associated with having some sense of ownership over a plot of land. Because, you know, if you own a plot of land, you have a lot kind of more rights in a way than if you're in a flat and you have to negotiate with all the residents and the field. There's a lot of complications, like legal complications that come from it, whilst also encouraging residents to lay down roots and engage with the wider community as they need, as they kind of adapt their homes. So this drawing explores more directly the roots of the project within the kind of housing construction conventions in suburbia. So it's really simply put together. Um, the shared surfaces and walls are made out of masonry to support the rest of the structure, which is largely kind of timber construction. It's conceived of as being very open, open-ended. You can rip things out, switch things. The things that remain are really like the ground and the party walls, like dividing the units, but everything else you can take out and adapt and change the appearance of. You can kind of see the model. So this is a really fun, perverse moment. So we were asked to display it above what it came from. <laughs> um, so this is a kind of, it's bedfellow that the origins of the home is below. You can see that's the house we were kind of looking at and responding to. And then those are the kind of four rooms. So you can see it's much, much smaller in scale. So I think this thread is about making the familiar strange or taking a really ordinary brief that you find like all the time like when you're first starting out designing and thinking how, how you can turn it into something. So, so the brief for this house was very typical and it was also unusual. So the clients were a young couple who'd been fortunate enough to buy half of this house. So the top two stories, I mean, this is, I should, no, this is quite expensive real estate in London, it's an angel. Um, so although it looks a bit drab, it's, you know, this is not, I guess, affordable housing, is an important caveat. But although the building was in a state of decay, so it's like falling apart, they wanted to remodel the interior to better suit their needs and kind of preference for open plan living. But they had really fallen in love with the, the, this kind of historic building and character. It's in a kind of historic area of London, I guess. It's kind of locally listed, what's called locally listed, which is that the local authority has kind of protected it for its historic merit. So on the one hand, the project was one of protection and restoration because the, of the building's listing. But on the other, the brief of the house was to tear it apart and open it up. <laughs> so, and cru crucially as well, you know, in relation to COVID, it was to create a workspace. So she wanted to work from home and she was setting up a kind of um, cosmetics business, which if you want to buy any of her stuff, it's called Austin and Austin. <laughs> Quick plug. So the building for us was somehow remarkable only for the many things that it has in common with the typ typical kind of London housing stock. So floor to ceilings are generous with a sidedness expressed through the formal front facade um, and informal closet wing condition. So informality to the back, they don't spend that much money on the back. The back is what the back needs to be. It's toilets, staircases and this stuff. The front is the street facade, which is often like much more structured. It's kind of there's a sense of streetscape as people take a lot of care about the proportion and these sorts of things. And the party walls, you'll see the party walls are the walls between the houses. So the, this kind of dividing wall are masonry again, much like the previous project we showed you with again, timber infill kind of cons construction. So this is 
it when it was a site, but you can see how it's kind of like put together, basically. It's really straightforward. There's all kind of historic beams and so on. But despite its relatively generous proportions, the spaces of the house at the time felt really small. And so the residents wanted to open up as much as possible. The converted flat was poorly organized. And basically there was this, this is the room she wanted to create a workspace and is basically with a ladder essentially. So they're like tiny tweaks, you know, like so much of housing as well. Like if you're, if we're going to design more sustainably and work with what's there and always, you know, there's a big campaign in the UK to never demolish another building and always to retrofit. You know, so much is like, although these briefs might sound boring, it's really important because it's about fine tuning the housing stock to really mirror how people want to live, right? So like even the fact that the staircase is a ladder, you know, that is something, you know, to be said as a critique of housing. Um, and our housing stock. There are tiny little clues that we can piece together to create a jigsaw, you know, which gives us, a, to, to create a picture that gives us a kind of clear image of what our, what's wrong and what's good about our housing stock. So anyway, uh, but weirdly, the guy loved this staircase, so they asked us to kind of think about how we can somehow work with it. So again, it's like, tear this house apart, keep it together. And so at the same time, there was a kind of pragmatics of the brief. Um, we were thinking like, how, how do you make a project out of this? So we were kind of cataloging all the elements of the home. We created this kind of totem, this, this thing we, were, we just wrote down every single object, thing, hinge, ironmongery, you know, everything that makes a home, that gives you a clue it's a home, it's not a university, it feels domestic. So how do you make something that makes you feel at home? And some of that specification involved retaining certain existing elements, like this old repaired window that the client loved. She just said she loved that it shows a kind of patina of the people who used to live there. And how can we kind of build off of this through a discrete set of in incisions into the built fabric? So we started with the window. We looked at the spaces that needed to be opened up. So this is a kind of blue steel that opened up um, and meanders throughout the house, like opens up all the walls that they wanted to open up. And we were thinking of this as kind of a bit of surgery, I guess. There were two more incisions. One was to really um, drop light into the stairwell. The second was to make it feel much more open and light. The second was to create a new window between the staircase and kitchen because they were you know we we're talking about them having a family and how you know when you're a kid you just run past your parent you know you it was very easy in this house because it's on the upper stories to run past the living spaces so you could easily not see each other um so we thought it'd be really nice to kind of create this connection that you can you can never avoid each other <laughs> but you can't like through when you're moving through between spaces in a way not when you're in your bedrooms or more private spaces. Um, and then more functionally, a new piece of furniture that was inserted. And this, ha this has as much of the things that we showed in the list um, before, but it helps the house to, to kind of house the new services. So at the bottom, there's a kind of dressing area, a relocated doorway on the middle floor, a storage for living um, areas, and so on and so forth, and basically the new stair, which has been opened up. And since most of the alterations could be consolidated and compressed into a vertical element, um, top to bottom of the house, it responded to our own kind of catalog of elements, as well as functional requirements of the brief. And just very quickly, um, I don't know, uh, yeah, well, the project is called Stele House. I don't know if you know what a Stele is, but it's, it's basically a monument a wooden totem that would be erected in Western culture um, to commemorate something. So we were saying that in order to kind of mark this new period of history of like the house, we would erect this the vertical element running through. So it meant that the rest of the house could be just economically really like just modest and just restored really sensitively and un unapologetically. 
and then the interventions would just sit within the corner of your vision so there'd be like moments that would flash by but they wouldn't dominate the aesthetic of the home so you can kind of get a sense and it was built super cheaply so this is it was just built with plywood you know the staircase cost two thousand pounds i think it was meant to cost eight thousand you know we were really working with nothing here um and this is a relocated enlarged doorway you can see that it's mainly the existing house and then there are these moments that are kind of inset within it view back to the kind of kitchen these photos show the peeling back so this is just we just treated the um the, this is the splashback moment so the splashback of the kitchen became this window to the stairwell that she loved that the client loved um and then the second window above and it was also, you know, we, all we said to the contractor was just cut a hole, like cut the hole and we'll, we, we, uh, we'll discover what's behind. We don't know what's behind. So the timber was a complete kind of, I guess it's a sort of accident what the setting out is. It's just meant to be a, a kind of reading of the archaeology of what's there in this historic building, I guess. So you can see like none of this was set out by us. This is just found. you know, um, how they then use these sh little shelves and niches to display things. So this is how um, her grandmother passed away and little artifacts and mementos of those, those things. So the connection between the stair and the kitchen and so on. Um, the element that the client enjoyed probably the most was we, we couldn't really find any handles for any of the joinery that, um, that um, somehow, uh, yeah, within budget, that they can't act. <laughs> but we also were realizing this tension in the brief where we were ripping out part of a staircase, which the client said that she loved, like she really loved. So we were like, okay, well, it seems like a real shame to do it. So why don't we work with a contractor to basically cut up the handrail? So we cut the handrail, we you know sliced it into different pieces, and then we formed all the joinery so all the joinery handles are made up for the old handrail and what you can't see necessarily from the front you kind of feel from the back like as you hold it you feel the old house basically that was removed so these are dispersed throughout um they're very modest joinery pieces but you'll you'll see that they are you know they're everywhere i don't know if you can see on the right like they're in all the pieces and it's just the old stair stair handle so we like this idea that kind of echoes of that old house kind of are felt throughout so ro rooms made from furniture so this project is the joining of two flats overlooking um chelsea harbour and the thames and despite being like really expensive the flat suffered from a very deep floor plan and really they're really badly built they were built by a, a ferry company, so a boat company. Um, so they're in some of the you know, highest real estate in London, I guess, in Chelsea, but somehow really poor housing stock. And it has no, some of the rooms had to kind of know, the whole centre had no access to natural light. And the client lived alone in both flats. So, you know, if he was like here, he never really understood that he owned all of this very luxurious position to be in i wish <laughs> no i don't wish i was in it but somehow there you go had a lot of space and so we started to think about ways to correct these kind of problems and trying to find uh some inspiration because the building itself was pretty awful um we we really loved the kind of craftsmanship and mechanics and ornament of furniture and we're and how they kind of give a domestic feeling to a space i guess and we were particularly taken by these kind of 19th century depictions of cabinets, which were used to hide bidets and toilets and bedpans and these sorts of things. So, you know, they look really ornamental, but they're, they're actually like, you know, in place of a loo, in place of a toilet. Um, and yeah, we really liked the idea that you would kind of conceal these intimate moments within something that feels like joinery. So we replan the whole flat around these kind of joinery pieces and all of them conceal sliding doors, um, 
you know, not really sliding doors, they're more like walls. They really close off the whole space. So that the client could at once um, live open plan, but then also close off everything and create, you know, actually what becomes quite a normal conventional flat. So there's this kind of idea that within the same space, you could have two types, either live within a normal flat or live within a completely open space. Um, and they would conceal the wet rooms. So, you know, the bathrooms and the joinery and dressing areas and these sorts of things. So some of the elements are kind of fixed. Well, I guess this is the, maybe I'll just say, that, yeah, these are the joinery pieces. So we created this model to kind of look at how you might live amongst them. But we were particularly taken about um, this view from the balcony or from both balconies. So the building was almost terrible, but the views were kind of incredible. Um, so we were wondering kind of like what you might do with it. And so, or how you might respond to it in terms of um, the furniture pieces themselves. We're of course looking at something like the background of Minson's um, Zoom, which is, the Barcelona um, pavilion and these kind of ornamental walls, but also kind of the artist Ronnie Horn, um, who made this still water series, which for us started the basis of a study into how a material can form an intimate and mythical portrait of a place. So when you see the series in the round, you start to appreciate how one material can exhibit multiple characters, whether that's things like geography, volume, or weather, um, through its color, its figuring, its depth. And she'd write these kind of little stories at the bottom. You can't really read the text, but there's this kind of mythical portrait of this river and saying it's not just water. Water has lots of qualities and these sorts of things. And we were looking at kind of veneered timber sheeting um, because it enabled us to create lots of figuring and all of these things. And we made lots of prototypes. So we set out 100 square meters odd of veneer. We worked closely with different suppliers, veneerers, lacquerers, um, to basically create a material that exhibits the same qualities as the water, the surrounding bodies of water. So it's essentially a combination of methods, staining, lacquering, buffering, and so on. So yeah, here's the cutting sheet of the veneer, but it was all hand cut, not laser cut. So we had to pick every bundle of veneer and hand pick it. And then you can see the one-to-one -one shots of the material in situ. So these are the kind of finished, this is it in, on site. So hopefully you can kind of see. So we took photos without furniture. So it's just, you'll just see the kind of naked state of the house. But here you can see the wall coming across. And what we, what we liked is that um, it's not just the kind of figuring, but it also starts to behave like water. So when viewed directly, when you're like looking front on, on the right, it, it, you can kind of see the depth and the figuring of, let's say the water or the veneer. But when you view it, obliquely it reflects with faint distortions also like water right and so even kind of within the tighter more corridor like spaces of the apartment as you move through it there's this constant interplay of like things revealing itself and things mirroring and it always mirrors back to the river itself and we create a kind of secret rooms and the, all these sorts of things i won't go into it so from one budget, that was a very expensive place, you know, house to another. So this is for a very cheap, very kind of the other end, the afford most affordable end. So we borrowed a lot of the kind of spatial principles and we were invited to propose a building for 12 artists for living and working in. And the brief asked us the invited practices to explore contemporary trends about sharing. So things like co-housing and things like co-working. But in many ways, the contingent factor was budget. So we have no money. And we looked at the spaces that artists have historically sort of um, used or sought out. And we see building types like warehouses or industrial buildings. And they aren't always purpose-built. They were not meant to be artist studios. They were meant to be workspaces for like manufacturing. But they are usually, they're usually inherently adaptable, robust spaces. So the qualities, you know, they're filled with light and they're large and they're open and they're cheap construction. And yeah, they may be cold, but they enable you to work in. And then 
artists create these kind of more thermally insulated zones where they might sleep or they might store precious works or these sorts of things or material. Um, so we like this idea of like bleeding your work and your living together, which I think we're doing, all of us are doing around the world at the minute, right? Um, and we were also intrigued by the idea that the small and big might coexist. So it, when we graduated, I don't know, when was that? <laughs> 10 years ago, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe even before. When I was in, graduated from undergrad, you would typically expect on your salary to be able to get something towards a two-bed apartment. That became a one-bed apartment pretty quickly with the housing crisis in the UK. Then it became a studio apartment, which is like half a million quid still in central London. That then became, you know, almost like a room with maybe a ensuite or, you know, something like a hotel room. Most people find themselves, even living in their 30s, in a bedroom in a house, in a shared house, you know, with friends because they don't want to live with their family. Those standards have basically been eroded as unscrupulous developers have you know turned bedrooms into you know like houses into tiny tiny bedrooms which people are trying to put a stop to and as a provocation i guess for this project we asked where does this end is it the bed and can we work with that and work backwards um so can a piece of furniture become a room so our proposition was quite simple rather than be build small apartments you know, small, mean apartments, you don't have money to do good apartments. So what's the point in trying? Why don't we build a multi-story warehouse? You know, a really robust, economic, generous shell, flooded with light. And the underlying notion is that if you're willing to share more, you could share those spatial resources within the building, keeping costs super low. So what you'll see, the exterior shell would be constructed really cheaply. So we were looking at the affordable housing scheme just next door, and we were just saying, we'll use the same thing. We'll just use this, the same material, we'll, but we'll compose it in an interesting way, maybe. So we kind of omitted some windows. We extended the lift shaft. We made small, tiny adaptions to it. So it relates formally to its context through the usual ways, windows, street presence, volume, massing, but on the one hand, we raised the vertical element. So this was the staircase and lift, um, which signals its position as a public building within a larger neighborhood. And the communal spaces we found, you know, um, were provided on the roof and the ground. So the ground was a kind of robust concrete uh, plinth containing large workshop space and space for talks and events. And the top floor is kind of a roof terrace. But then crucially, the things like the stair core became an observatory. So like it took you to a height where you could see all the way across London. And it was a moment for just, you know, very intimate moments within the building for two or three people. The interior is slightly less simple, but draws itself from the same logic as the apartment that we showed. So the diagram here indicates how the beds became the structuring device for the plan. Um, taking into account their proximity to daylight, ventilation, and each other. Um, so we were really like conscious about, you know, creating the shared spaces, but also like how, you know, in the placing these things, you can start to carve out more private rooms and how they could build between these to kind of close off areas if they want. So they could have their bedroom and private study, but also be part of a much larger kind of living space. And it would be like really cheaply built from plywood, basically. So that material study from the previous project just becomes like plywood and people can paint it and decorate it and put partitions. But it just becomes the basis, the shell that people then can adapt. And as a framework, the architecture kind of just creates cues for its use and misuse. But beyond that, the community would be invited to adapt the structure as they need and as they want within certain rules, certain kind of governing rules. So we produced this drawing which shows those kind of cues of the observatory, 
kind of the small amendments. Think back to the furniture where I talked about the small little cues for use. And these are precisely the same thing. And we were looking at this kind of public ground and how you can Im embed certain ideas of use within it without dictating what those uses are. So there's a kind of openness to the interpretation as to what the building can become. And you're leaving room for the resident to um, think. So very quickly, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to have to speed through the next 30 slides. So room that changes or changing rooms. So thinking about how in recent months we've turned our attentions to the immediate surroundings, the home, its reorganization to account for newly demanded uses like work or teaching and these sorts of things are interesting and problematic when space is limited. So it works really well when you have a lot of space, but it's difficult without. And so we were looking at kind of um, the work of our, the our Swiss artists Fischli and Weiss and their kind of equilibrium experiments and their images of kind of household objects and studio detritus arranged to form kind of these precariously balanced assemblages in kind of improvising what you have to hand and we thought that these are amazing kind of like ways of thinking about building and like how you can build strange weird kind of things from from just the things that are around you, you can co-opt, you can design from anything almost. And in them you see kind of chairs, brooms, cheese graters, wine bottles, household items and so on and so forth. Um, so we were really inspired by them, not for their humor or their whimsy, but um, because they communicate something about how mundane, how everyday materials can somehow become something else. You know, the surrealists were doing it, lots of people were doing it. Um, and transform them into something quite different, to elevate them. Um, and they also served as a really important lesson in reduction for us. So the fact that you can, that we have virtually nothing, you know, our age that we're entering is one of complete scarcity. We have, you know, we shouldn't be using too many materials. We shouldn't be using, we don't have the resource to do the, to build or the way that we have for the, you know, if we're going to be build equitably for people. Um, so how do we do it? And these are, we thought these are kind of interesting experiments. Um, a slight side note, but somehow it percolates our work, I think. So in some ways, this thinking is being practically tested right now. So we're building 22 homes in Enfield for a not-for-profit developer called Naked House. So they're kind of, um, they don't make profit. All the savings that they make are passed on to the end user. And it was basically to provide a financially accessible threshold to home ownership by driving down the cost of building and acquiring land. And because Naked House are not-for-profit, um, all the savings are passed on to the purchasers. That's really critical because it's very different from a typical developer who would drive down quality and costs to earn more money. This is like, it's, it's written into their legal structure that they have to pass on everything to the future owner. So this model kind of shows the general site conditions. They're all to the backs of people's gardens. They're really difficult. Um, these are kind of work early kind of, this is how we won the competition. I can't show the current drawings because um, it's confidential in a way um, until we submit the planning application. But yeah, it shows the kind of things that we're, we're producing. And many of the principles start from the foundation that houses should be adaptable and be able to change but also that it doesn't need to be overly complicated we just looked at really simple ways that people already understand how to adapt their home the loft conversion and the re-extension and we looked at how we can just facilitate these so how can we build a structure that enables that so that it's not difficult to do and how can we use the cheapest kind of construction methods um, and standardized details just repetitive details to enable that so everything is kind of built using kind of design and build. So where the architect's appointment stops once permission is given, like, you know, normally that's considered super bad, but we were like, let's work with it. Let's see if we can create something from it. And we made an early decision with the kind of engineering team to avoid complicated systems, prefabrication, all of these things. They were not suitable for DIY or for building with local tradespeople. You'd have to use kind of specialist companies. There were a lot of conversations around, you know, how we can work with the local community, what the priorities and values of the kind of um, of the kind of the overall project is, and how we can translate that into 
a construction pallet. Um, but basically, we wanted to ensure an inherently flexible, adaptable shell that doesn't require any expertise, that anyone can adapt it, so that it's DIYable, like you can do it yourself. It's an affordable entry-level shell that is generously proportioned, so big spaces um, and loaded with potential, and that the hard work, the like difficult work of construction is done by the contractor, but the resident then can finish it off. So that's the general principle. And part of this idea is not only to build, well, I won't go into too much detail, but we really love this diagram by the American writer Stuart Brand, who talks about how buildings learn and which builds on the work of the British architect, Frank Duffy. So basically Brand proposed the theory of shearing layers where site structures, skin services, space plan and stuff um, to explain this process of change. Um, so basically like, some things are almost eternal, like sight. Some things are super temporary. Some things change all the time. So rather than thinking about a finished object in a moment of time, how can we think about the full lifespan of, a, of an object? And we need to think this way. It's becoming clearer and clearer, right? In relation to the climate and all of this stuff. So the houses in their naked state, the houses in their adapted state. So we drew lots of different scenarios of like how people can convert them into two beds, three beds, keep them in studios, workspaces, um, offices, you know, like all of these different things, how, how they can accept many things. So some people might want to leave them naked. So we were also discussing at length about how we can just like have a shell and yet yeah, feels quite brutal and it feels like it needs to be infilled, but nevertheless, we thought that, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the project. And it's not something radical or new. I don't think we're proposing anything radical or new. It's just how people live and designing for that. <laughs> it's like, this is how people live in the suburbs. Let's make a design strategy from it. Um, I'm gonna skip through this. I think I've made the main points of this, but we were kind of looking at how the house can be viewed from a neighboring property and so on and so forth. I have one last project to talk about and I'm conscious about time. So sorry for skipping the last section, but those main points are there. So an evolving urban surface made by the many. This is a very early project, um, but I think it's still relevant for us. So we want to, it is basically was a competition to design a public space in Detroit. There were, you know, hundreds of entries. We came third in the end, um, but it was Detroit, like kind of, I guess, nearly all development in the US is structured around a grid system. There's like a framework, it's adaptable, it, much like I'm talking about the building, um, buildings. The grid is kind of the ubiquitous American plan. It's a triumph of idealism over reality. Um, so while dividing the city and nation into regular plots, it also presents the possibili po infinite possibilities of continuation of adaptation of change. So for all its problems, the grid is the framework onto which millions of people have placed their own interpretation of the American dream from a skyscraper to a suburban home. So a drawing showing the relentless development of the city in the late 19th century as a kind of industry and its byproducts spread further and further into the surrounding landscapes, this kind of continuous map extending and extending. And so many cities around the world are experiencing, you know, similar patterns of growth. And Detroit, but Detroit is also a city that gave birth to the production line. Um, so here we see the Ford Model T kind of chassis rolling out the factory floor. So this is, you know, mass production, a kind of invention by Ford, which then turns into kind of mass consumerism later, you know, which is also a battle between car companies. I think it was Ford and, oh God, I've forgotten. There were, maybe Chrysler. There were like two car companies that were like, competing with each other, which created like mass, mass marketing, disposable kind of products so that people can continuously consume and consume and consume. It's quite amazing how much the car industry beyond its pollutants have shaped our, our ways of thinking about consumerism and life. Um, but anyway, so also set out with a grid and look at the, the kind of architecture on the left as well. But we were kind of more interested, we were kind of asking ourselves, what the first tendency of the American planning system might be, or more, even more generally, that of the human action of kind of appropriating land. And we read this as planting a marker. 
and they're interested in the idea of how this could ceremonial staking of ground could claim some kind of ownership or all the way through to more ordinary or everyday acts of construction. So the image on the right is a festival we built in, um, in a design festival in London, but we really love the kind of comparison, this kind of embedded act of, you know, people raising something, constructing something. On the left, it's a nation. On the right, it's um, a tent. <laughs> and thinking back to this kind of cave of hands. So there was this cultural depiction of collective construction and uh, Diego Rivera's murals of the Detroit production line, you know, where these cars were being manufactured, inspired thoughts about the project. How can you embed the very act of making into the project? You know, so much, I don't know if you know about like so much of like Motown and music came, was inspired by people working on the production line, the sounds and the environment, you know, these sorts of things. So the product is not so much, but we, crucially, the project is not so much about making an end product like the car, but rather a continual act of making or process of making. And the city itself has been in decline for a number of years and has suffered a lot from dispersal of population and tax base, kind of, and tax base into the suburbs. So, you know, it's potted with the decay, like it's being torn down at the inner city. It's like full, of, you know really tragic it went bankrupt you know they're really big problems and images like this may or may not be familiar to you but Detroit is a fascinating place um and this is the downside downtown area kind of nearby to the site in question where you have um GM's headquarters the setting of the film Robocop um and this is the actual site shown during the 80s during a technical uh, techno festival another famous Detroit export. Um, and I guess what we found really problematic in the brief was when you have all of these issues and these problems to do a project that is about tabula rasa, kind of erasing and wiping of all, this his, all these historical layers, all of this history to create more or less the same thing again and just to repeat this model over and over again just feels really tragic when the city itself can barely sustain itself and people can barely sustain itself, uh, uh, sustain an economy even, like, you know, the city went bankrupt. So like we propose a different kind of production line. The production line is kind of predicated on the efficiency of output of like an identical object and any difference is thrown away. But we wondered if there, it could, whether we could create a production line that produced something new each time kind of subverting the homogeneity of the Ford's production line. So the proposal starts with the simple making of clay molds, a set of markers or stellae. So each, as the communities and individuals return to this area, which was written into the brief that they want people to come back, they could cast a marker, a kind of symbolic marker of their arrival, which would then be cast into site, iron in, on site in refer reference to the material that made the city. And after which there would be a ritual raising, which would be the community members would come back and ordinary acts of construction would take on a kind of ceremonial significance. And what you see here is those markers kind of bleeding across the entire site. Um, and the surface of the site remains completely unchanged. And rather than the existing landscape is kind of reframed and the project becomes a sort of barometer, you know, of, of people returning. So our thought was that you could just raise one marker and it could stop there. If there's no political will for the project to continue and no, there's no momentum behind it, then that itself tells the story. And there's no like 20 million pound, 50 million pound, you know, spend on something that the city doesn't need or want. But if there is an appetite and people come back and this 40% of, you know, empty properties around suddenly like, people return to this bit of New York, of, of Detroit even, sorry, um, then the project can happen and it bleeds across the whole site. And um, by broadly, and of course they have to be a grid, you know, like for the reasons that I've kind of described and it could extend into the river and city beyond and they would become pieces of furniture. They, they would become street lights, you know, to make things safer and they'd have a very ordinary prosaic human humane function. <laughs> Um, providing a place to meet. 
and at its edges, rather than the kind of hard European edge to a square, we were just proposing a canopy. And that canopy, you know, could, there's a kind of secondhand, you know, uh, really thriving kind of market of secondhand goods from houses that are being taken apart and, you know, these sorts of things. So we were saying like, these things can happen here. That's what good public space is. It's one which is layered and open to interpretation, right? Um, but at the heart of it, the whole project was a column and retaining the kind of individual marks and hand marks and handprint, thinking back to the cave of the people who made it. But combined together, they're intended to act as a new kind of subtly continuous layer that aggregates over time. It's one more handprint on the city without erasing any of the others. Um, as people and businesses return. Um, so as a set of similar yet from singular monuments, they tried to provide a sense of ownership to the plaza. So it's really about, you know, it becomes, it's less about like conquest and imperialism and like claiming other territory or this, the, you know, the seabed or the moon or these sorts of things, but rather claiming back their city. There you go. That's it. <laughs> that was brilliant. That was really nice uh, start at the end um, notions. You know, at the beginning, you talked about the marking territory, you know, with the, with the hand images and this final project with the columns just like matches brilliantly. Nice. Thank you very much. It was really inspiring. And there were so many nice um, precedents and all those um, lovely, really lovely words and images really inspires us. Thank you very much. I didn't talk too quickly. <laughs> huh? Sorry, I overran. Oh yeah, there was a bit moments when we were, uh, but yeah, it was okay <laughs> for me. Oops. I can answer questions, but if you'd rather do it via email, I, I'm happy either way if anyone has any okay. questions.